Hello, everybody, and good evening to our last Twitter spaces before Christmas. Um, I actually can't believe I'm saying that. Christmas seems to come around faster every year. And this year, this evening, I'm joined by some fantastic speakers. And we're planning on talking to you a little bit about Christmas, sharing some tips and some ideas about Christmas and how to make Christmas as successful as possible if, if you're living with dementia. And I think it's it's fair to say that Christmas means many, many things to many, many people um, from, you know, obviously it's a religious festival. It's a religious period of observance. Um, it's also a time where families come together and we enjoy food and festivities and um, drink as well, you know, for, for many families. And, and it can stir up a range of emotions. And whilst we want Christmas to be a fantastic, happy, joyful period, of course, it can also for some families be be quite difficult and, and quite challenging. And, and we, we absolutely know that, which is why we wanted to do this space this evening to, to talk a little bit about that. So what I'm going to do is just ask my guest speakers this evening to come up, just quickly say hello and a little bit about themselves. And then I'll tell you a little bit about how to use Twitter spaces. And then we'll, we'll ask, go on and, and have our conversation and, and also have opportunities for you to come up and ask us any questions that, that you might like to. So, um, Liz, can I ask you to just unmute quickly and let's just check that we can hear you this evening. Hi, everyone. Um, is that OK, Vic? Can you hear? That is perfect, Liz. Thank you. We can hear you really loud and clear. Do you do you want to just say a little bit about who you are at this point? And then, um, thank you. So I'm Liz Tomlinson. I'm uh, one of many Admiral nurses. Um, I lead services over in Rotherham. I work in primary care with GP surgeries. I've been an Admiral nurse for seven years now um, and it's the best job in the world. Yeah, I completely agree with you on that, Liz. It's, <laughs> it's, I can't imagine doing anything else, and I can't. I don't think there's many people who can say that, especially when they've been in. I've been twenty years now. <laughs> still can't imagine doing anything else. So completely. No, I neither can I. <laughs> neither can I. Honestly, it's a fantastic job because you get to make a difference to to families every day, and, and it's so rewarding, isn't it? it is. uh, thank you, thank you, Liz. I'm, it's always a relief when your speakers can talk on these things. Things. So Denise, <laughs> <laughs> Denise, let's keep hope the good vibes keep going. Denise, are you able to unmute and say hello? Hi, yeah, good evening. Uh, my name's Denise Hughes. I'm actually a volunteer for the charity um, Dementia UK. I came to this role having had the benefit of an Admiral Nurses experience and um, I just wanted to give something back. I just want to get out there champion the charity let people know what it's all about and hopefully in the long run we can get many more admiral nurses i'm actually from an area where unfortunately um you need to have had certain um associations with relative um agencies before you can get the benefit in my area and i want to see that change i want want it there for every carer if we can Oh, agree with you wholeheartedly, Verdenice. And and this is one of the things that in you're quite right, in some areas at the Admiral Nurses are restricted in the numbers of people and the types of people who they can work with and support because of the way that the, that service is commissioned. I guess um, it's something we desperately want to see changed. But the, the thing to always remind people as well is that obviously um, our helpline, our clinics appointments, the stuff we're doing at Dementia UK to try and make sure that wherever possible um, somebody can, can speak to an Admiral nurse and get some support, even if you're not fortunate enough to, to live in an area where there is one commissioned but I am convinced Denise that one day we will absolutely get there and we will have Admiral Nurses working to be able to offer that face-to-face -face support to families at the point that they need it. That's that's ultimately our, our, our overall ambition and, and goals. So we share that with you and thank you for volunteering as well and, and all of the work that you're, you're doing. To Vic, can I just say wholeheartedly for everybody that's listening, I do find this subject very emotive, so please do excuse me <laughs> oh. if I sound a little bit you know, tearful or something. I, I, it's just an extremely emotive subject for me. 
Right, you know, and, and I, I completely share that with you as well, because it is really difficult, isn't it? It's it's something you're passionate about. I know that. And, you know, and, and, and you know, we I completely share that with you as well. But this is I know it sounds strange when we're live on Twitter and doing this, but honestly, I want you to see this as a safe space and all emotions are welcome. Um, You know, just just go with the flow. And it's just us having a chat. Just ignore everybody else beneath us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's just us having a chat um and mm. and, and and i get you because I, I i feel the same and, and i often get emotional as well so thank you so much everybody what i'm just going to do quickly um i think most of you who are here this evening know how twitter spaces works but i'm just going to give you a really super quick whiz through on that and then we'll we'll launch into the conversation because i want everybody listening to to really get as much as possible out of this evening so the way it'll work is is I'm going to ask some questions, have a bit of a discussion with with Liz and Denise, and you're 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 more than welcome, obviously, to sit and and listen to us, or stand and walk, or do whatever it is you're you're doing, and, and listen to us. If you want to ask us any questions, if you want to to, you've got two ways you can do that. You can, not quite yet, but very soon I'll open the mics up. You can request the mic. You can come up. And you can ask us a question directly that way. Or the other thing that you can do is you can um, send, a, send us the question. And the way that you do that is down at the, the bottom of your screen somewhere, you'll see a little um, speech bubble. I'll, I'll pop a little message in there soon just so that you know where that is. And it'll, it'll highlight purple on your screen. When, when, if you want to ask a question that way, you can absolutely do that, and we'll we'll see that question, and and then be able to answer it because I know not everybody feels comfortable and muting and asking to be a speaker and, and coming up and and asking the question. Obviously, if you're listening to this as part of a, a pre-recording, if you're listening to it in a week's time or a few weeks' time or even longer than that, you, you won't be able to interact that way with us or, or ask any questions um, because you have missed the live session. I can't do anything about that. That's just the way it is. So um, thank you, everybody, for, for that. I'm not going to go through any of the other features other than the one that you might have spotted, which is the ability to send us emojis um, which is something we, we we do it's really nice when you're speaking to see some of those emojis coming up because it just lets us know that you're listening and that it's it's interesting to you so so do feel free to to hit any of those emojis as as and when you you like and again that obviously that's only a live feature when you're in the space with us tonight so um, I'm going to go back to my introduction and I was talking about Christmas and, and the and one of the things I talked about is the, the, the range of emotions that, that Christmas can, can stir up, that can bring for people. And, and, and I know, Denise, when you were talking, I, I fully get this because my, my grandmother had dementia and she used to come for, to our house at Christmas. And, uh, and you know, as a, as a family, we had quite a strict plan and a routine where different people would have different roles and jobs to to make sure that Christmas went as smoothly as possible for, um, for all of us and obviously including grandma so one of the things we used to do is we also said had a rota so it was mum's job to to do her medication to make sure she was fed and she was eating and to really keep an eye on on all of those things it, it was my job because I could do this the best I guess from my experience my, my the work I've done it was my job to um help her having a bath having a wash having a shower getting her clothes changed um going to the toilet all of those kinds of things was, was stuff that I did um dad's role was to make sure that she didn't drink too much because she was always looking for a whiskey or a lager and you know and would tell everybody she hadn't had one and then everybody would get her a drink and then we, before we'd know it she'd have had far too much to drink and and of course that that wasn't something that we, we really wanted her, her to be getting drunk and, and and having too much to drink so that's some of how we survived Christmas was by having that really kind of pre-agreed routine and plan and, and also that ability to really be flexible if we needed to um you know I remember one Christmas when she she didn't want to leave the the care home and get up and, and I went down and was able to get her out of bed and, and get up so you, you kind of have to have that ability to be flexible and 
And these emotions do all stir up at this time of year. And I guess I'd just be interested in asking you both, why do you think that is? Um, why, why do you think we get so emotional at Christmas about all, everything? Or, or is that just me? <laughs> is that just something that happens to me? And I don't mind who who wants to try and answer that one first. Is I don't mind coming in there, Vic. Um, so uh, I, I'm I'm just like you. I my grandmother was uh, like my mum really, and she brought me up, and and she had dementia. She had mixed Alzheimer's and vascular dementia, and I think Christmas for us was quite emotive um, because of it, it, sometimes you reflect and you look back on how things were many many years ago. And then to up to the point to where you are now, and you know you have to adapt. Um, and sometimes you, you you know you feel emotive for missing uh, what was, but we have to make sure that we make good use of of what we've got now and how to make that um, you know really nice and and settling and um, it, just really making it comfortable. Um, and I think we reminisce a lot at Christmas. And that plays a big part on our emotions. Um, I don't know what you think, Denise. I know you said it's a little bit of a hard topic um, because the emotion behind it is, you know, it's 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 hard. It's difficult, especially when you've had a loved one um, who you feel so emotionally connected to. Uh, well, from my point of view, Mum was always the one that sort of orchestrated everything. You know, certainly with the food and, you know, she was there. She'd do things like dress the turkey. She'd always make her Christmas puds, you know, the Christmas cake. And the things that I still do, you know, and suddenly that person that has always been there doing those things isn't with you in the same way. Yes, so they're physically, but it's that mental side of it. Even though, you know, at the point when her health was failing she was still in a position sometimes to dress the turkey so she was doing all these little bits still to be involved with it and then suddenly she couldn't and I suddenly thought it's me I'm doing it all you know and suddenly the roles had changed and I think it's just accepting that that's it and you just make the best of that situation and now trying to pass these sort of things on like to my daughter and eventually, hopefully my granddaughter, when she's of an age, that these things can be done. You know, it's um, it's difficult, you know, and if she's the one that's always hosted and been there and been that figurehead yeah. towards Christmas. I think that, you know, you're right, that shifting of roles and, you know, especially because it, it you know, it's your mum who, who had dementia and and I, I don't wish to sound sexist at all, but in lots of families, it is very much the, the female domain to, to kind of create and, and, and you know, do that, that kind of preparation in, in the run up to Christmas. And, and I actually think lots of people feel a degree of stress and anxiety as we approach Christmas because we put this almost unrealistic expectation on it it's just a day after all but we put such a lot of expectation and pressure on it to be a perfect day of merriment and fine food and everything being lovely and which isn't realistic is it? it's not it's it's not what it's like for many families um in actual fact so i guess that's that's one of the things is 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 I, I like when you said about that that just go with the flow a bit and get on with you know you've got to get on with things haven't you what what else can you do i guess it's... no there's there's no point in dwelling on what has been life goes on you know and we've just got to keep going for everybody that's around us, you know, the, you know, ordering process, should we say, of who does things, it may change, but you've got other people to think about, you know, and when there's children around, you know, you're doing it all for them in the long run, you know, you may have had your family traditions and all the rest of it, and they just shift somewhere, they move to different people, you know, and we will take that mantle on elsewhere. Yeah, we ad no, we yeah. adapt, don't we? We adapt to what what's going on, and 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 like you've just been saying, Vic, about it being perfect. You know, things might not go in the order that we want to, um, but that's okay. 
it's okay for things to change and it's okay to ju just meet the needs of, of you and your family on that day um, and go with the flow and adapt to what's happening. Very true. I think that's it, isn't it? And one of the things that I, I often talk about, and I, and I know, Liz, you've, you've done some advice around this as top tips, but, but one of the things we often talk about is planning ahead and having a plan. But, but I guess the caveat to having a plan is that ability to just take that plan and chuck it out the window if you need to or completely tweak it if, if you need to, um, because, you know, it, it, it just might not go the way you've you've envisioned it envisioned i can't get that word out you <laughs> the way you planned it in your head it might it might need to adapt and and change so can i can i ask a little bit about if you if you if somebody's listening now and they are starting to think and i know christmas is, is fast approaching but if you were starting to think about what what you would put in a plan um in terms of planning ahead what what would you recommend and i can think of certain things like it, i was for me at the moment i'm really worried about making sure i've got the medication i need for for people to make sure that they you know we're not running out of medication on boxing day and making sure that that's that's in in you know we've got the right medication that we need there and people know what they're doing and so you know we, we, there's not that confusion amongst the family but w what other things would you put in that that plan i guess that's one for you liz perhaps or, or indeed for you denise <laughs> Uh, if I can come in here on that one, I've, it, I've yeah. thought a lot about this since you've sent these questions through and I've discussed it with my daughter. She's also in healthcare. So all these little things, as you rightly say, medication, make sure that's on top of them. Another thing I say, if you're bringing somebody out from their own home and out of their own um, medical catchment area, perhaps if need be, have their health checked if they're coming to stay with you for a while to make sure they're healthy. There's no risk that there's going to be a sudden ad hospital admission somewhere along the line. As you say, definitely medication. Notify the neighbours. and that. Or expect the unexpected. Perhaps as well if there's any appropriate legal documentation available. Make sure you've got that. You don't want those sort of things to be spoiling the sort of holiday period. You made such a good point there about if someone's going outside of an area because often people do, don't they? And people can sometimes yeah. travel hundreds of miles to see each other over the Christmas period. And and actually, you know, we for all of us, routine's important. But if you've got so if you're living with dementia, you know, actually what what do you need to make that shift and that change? as as you know as easy or as smooth as possible because if you're in a totally different house and you know or, or a house that's less familiar to you are you going to know how to find the toilet how to get where's your room you know all of these things to just need a little bit of consideration don't they and and, and you're absolutely right about making sure you've got the the right any paperwork that you need with you so that if something you know did happen that you you suddenly needed you you'd have things there rather than them being 200 miles away down the motorway um you know which is the last thing anybody would want to do at, at christmas time liz any any other things around planning yeah i was gonna i was just gonna mention about you know making sure you've got if you're out of area especially um making sure you know what emergency numbers um to use should anything happen or should you need any support over that time you know who is it that you're going to call um having gp details and and maybe other number for uh crisis teams or um, i'm not saying that a crisis is going to happen but just being again just planning ahead being prepared we've got all bases covered should anything happen i've got the support there that i need at that time it's, it's so important in in terms of that plan i think we've we've said it already but it, i think it's also important to to be kind to yourself and know what's realistic because you know you you might and, and certainly in my family we we had to get to this point where we, we you know it was no longer realistic to expect my grandma to come and stay with us for a couple of days and you know and we had to think well this is having too much of a an impact. This is getting too 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 hard. And Denise, I know you had a similar thing in your family, didn't you? Where you you, you had to slightly change some of the, the the plans and the way that you you might do things. 
Yes, that's true. What are you thinking about, Vic? Is that with regards to my son? How yeah. are you thinking? Yeah, that's what I was thinking because I know it's it's yeah. one of those things. I mean, we 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 sort of having to think similar things through in my family and yeah. Um, yeah, um, well, obviously, he had a lot of difficulty actually sort of coming to terms with it and dealing with it because obviously he had his own issues to deal with. Um, for those that are listening, I'm talking about somebody that's on the autistic spectrum here. Um, as much as he loved his nan and that, he found it very hard to deal with her being around. As it was Christmas Day, he would work. So, yeah, he'd come back in from work and that. He'd, he'd obviously have a meal with us. And that he would pass the pleasantries um, for the day, that sort of thing. A little bit of interaction, but he really struggled to cope with it. Um, couldn't go and see her once she was in the home or even at her own home. Um, we had an incident. We'd taken her shopping in for her one day. And he said, I can't do this anymore. And that she's, he said, she's looked at me like she's looking through me and doesn't know me. And that really hurt him. And it was trying to justify that. But I couldn't deny him his Christmas Day. I couldn't deny her her Christmas Day and that. So when she was coming to us, we had an overlap of somewhere approximately of a few hours. So she wasn't sort of rushed around and pushed out. It was taken at her pace. You know, they got to see her. But he obviously dealt with it in his own way. He knew I was here for him if he needed to talk about anything and that, but quite often he would perhaps say, hide away in his room, and that I wasn't going to force him to do something he didn't want to. And I think it's just, you know, playing it by ear, how do they react? Because somebody with dementia is unpredictable. You don't know one little thing could be changing the way they're behaving at that particular point in time, and that could upset everybody. So we just had to sort of play it by ear, go with the flow, and that he's come through it unscathed, you know. I hope he has anyway. It's um but it's just preparing and preparing somebody like him that this is going to happen, this person is going to be there. Yeah. And I think that's it. And the the reason that I kind of asked you about that now is because I think when you you know when you said earlier on about other people as well, because you know, for many of us Christmas involves a number of people, doesn't it? And it's actually what are their needs? What do they want? What does what does good look like for them? Um, how can we make this 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 day as positive for all of these people involved? And 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 it can be really quite challenging actually when you've got different needs and and I, you know and, and I, I think one of the things you said earlier about was uh, allowing him to to go to his room if he needed uh, you know kind of providing that that quiet space that that place where you know you don't all have to be together all the time and I think that's that's one of the things that we talk about if you if you are bringing somebody with dementia and, and I also know it can be really useful if someone has got autism as well can't it to provide them with that that safe space, that quiet space, where they can just get away from the Christmas music and the tinsel and the flashing lights and and the rest of it, and just have a quiet space that they they can just um, decompress or relax if if they want to. And I, I guess is that something that um, Liz, I know you 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 might want to say something about at that point or yeah. So so it's, you know I think that links in with um, you know but perhaps trying to avoid overstimulation as well so providing that quiet place so that you know there, there isn't that overstimulation and, and room for maybe um some frustration or agitation because that's it, it, it's it's a calm time isn't it keeping it simple let's keep it as simple as pos possible and just reiterating what you say uh Vic about being kind to yourself um I think we are always uh, really hard on ourselves to try and make things as perfect as we possibly can but sometimes you know it's it's just not it's not possible um it'll be perfect for you and it'll be perfect for um your loved one um ju just being together um and just having that comfortable time um around one another and around the family 
I think you've said two really important things there, Liz. So one of the things that you said that I loved was when, when you said keep it simple, because we, you know, it, we, you, it doesn't have to be everybody in the family coming around for hours and, you know, and it, it, it doesn't even have to be great big plates full of food and candles and all of, the, all of that, does it? So, you know, I guess keep it as simple as possible. And, and the other thing that I really liked that you said is about avoiding overstimulation because we know, um, don't we, that, you know, if, if you've got dementia and you've potentially got visual disturbances or, you know, flashing lights, music, lots of people talking, that might be quite hard to to deal with. And for anybody, it can actually. But certainly if you've if you if you are living with dementia, it's it, it, it might be too stimulating, too much noise, too much interaction and, and actually sort of take taking those steps to to avoid that overstimulation and, and keep it simple might actually really help or go a long way to providing a, a, you know, a, a less stressful Christmas, perhaps, um, as, as you go through that period. Denise, oh, it was Liz who were muted. Sorry, I thought it was no, Denise. Right, <laughs> no, go I was on. just going to touch again, Vic, on you just said, you know, don't, don't overfill plates. Um, I think that's really, really important. Um, not overfacing people, you know, little and often. Um let's nibble through the day and and you know just just keep our energy levels up ours too as well as our loved ones keep our energy levels up and you know just don't overface people because it's likely that you know that they'll, they'll eat a smaller plate than a bigger plate and making sure that plates and things are uh, plain in color um to, to, to make sure you know the contrast and things because we know that sometimes spatial awareness and vision and things are affected by dementia so having a, a plain plate uh, makes it much easier to see uh, different foods that are on there. Yeah, Thank you for, for adding to that and I think again you know, if I think about what a Christmas table might look like, um, and again, this is going to be different for every family, and you know, and, and but some families you're going to have crackers and party poppers and tinsels and candles and centerpieces and many knives and forks. And I, I, I don't know. That's that's by the way, not my family, but in in the in the ideal world, that's that's what we we aspire to a degree, isn't it? And, and actually, that can all of that can mean the table looks very very busy and very very confused. <laughs> and and that's going to overstimulate somebody as well. Denise, I'm sure I saw your mic on you. Am I right? I thought so. Yes, I was. One thing I was going to say is sort of about planning ahead and that and talking about different people. You may have somebody that's coming for your Christmas Day that perhaps isn't aware of how your relative is like or what they're likely to behave like. So perhaps warn them that perhaps they could be a bit blunt in what they say a little bit acerb acerbic in some of their comments. And also there may be like in inhibitions. You know, if somebody else isn't used to that, they may take offence to it when in fact it's unfortunate. It's just something that happens because of the nature of that disease process. I think that's that. Yeah, that's a fantastic um, addition as well because it is important. And, and we know, don't we, that, you know, sometimes families don't see each other from year to year or from month to month and and that's actually if you're if you're not pre-warned what you're going to see or what that person might look like or how they might have changed in in that period it can be one of the things that certainly I, I remember in in my family it used to sometimes cause a bit of friction because people would come and say oh I don't think she's doing very well at this or have you tried this or maybe you should try that and, and it, it used to cause I, I don't think my mum would mind me saying this well, i'm going to say it anyway i think it would it used to cause a degree of um, frustration because you know the, we're here doing this this caring role day in day out and you've popped up and you've not been here for ages and you're giving all this advice and and it can sometimes be be well-meaning but actually quite quite hard at times if you it, it, i guess it's about making sure people are prepared and they know 
you know, as much as possible, what, what to expect. Can I ask you as well? So one of the things I was, I was thinking about um, in, in preparation for this is around uh, on our, our helpline, we often see an increase in calls after Christmas and lots of people phoning us exactly because of what I was just talking about. They've seen their loved one over Christmas. They're suddenly aware of changes. And, and one of the things that I always kind of add here when when I'm thinking about this is actually if somebody if you do notice changes in somebody um and it's over the Christmas period I guess it's it's just thinking through what might be going on for this person and some of it we've talked about earlier on so somebody taking their their medication have they got the medication as they needed are they overstimulated are they drinking too much are they not eating enough or are they eating too much and is is that causing some uncomfort are they in in pain you know could that person have an infection or something or or is there some of a physical change that that's going on um for example you know maybe someone's forgotten a hearing aid and then they can't hear properly or or are they suddenly having hearing difficulties and and because i think all of us our behavior changes a little bit over christmas and we, we all act a little bit differently but if if you see those those changes it's important to just try and work out what might be going on and and is there sometimes you know is it because you you know that there's something happening that that's led to that change and i don't know if either of you want to to add anything more about that i think just on that vic i'd like to say perhaps once they get back into their own own environment reassess them again then it could just be the environment that's changed you're absolutely right and you know yeah, absolutely. You're right. And if, you know, if, if somebody, it, yes, it might just be that it's a bit of a change because they're in a different place and they're having lots of different food or whatever. And and don't make any sudden changes yourself if you can. Don't, I, you know, sometimes people ring us up and say, oh, it's been really hard. I think one thing in care home and you think, well, actually, just wait a minute, just to see what happens in, in a, a week or two, you know, see if things settle back down again once all of the Christmas um, madness has subsided a little bit. Uh, um, so thank you for that. Denise, can I, sorry, Liz, did you, you want to say something? Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. I was just going to, I was just going to touch upon, um, again, what Denise is saying about environment and things, because what, what we sometimes need to remember is that when we take somebody out of a place that's really, really familiar into somewhere that's not familiar and have to sort of relearn that in a very very short space of time that's really confusing and mm. frustrating and it, and it you know it's it's very likely that it is going to make somebody feel a little bit different to what they're like in in familiar surroundings um and and just one more thing obviously with my clinical head on um just making sure there's you know no infection is the is the behavior changing due to infection urine infection chest infection anything that's going on there which it again reiterates making sure you've got the right numbers um the right telephone numbers for people that you might need to be in contact with over the festive period yeah you're, you're so right Thank, thanks for saying that Liz. so um can I ask you a couple of questions, Denise? And, and, and I'm just going to also ask if anybody does have a question they'd, they'd like to ask, feel free to, 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 to either pop it in the chat box or, or just unmute and you know, I'll request Mike and, and come up and we'll, we'll try to answer any questions that you might have. But Denise, I know you've spoken a little bit about um, your experience of, of Christmas with your family and and I know that um, you're a nurse and I, I know because you've told me already that, that both um, your, your mother and your father actually had dementia and can you can you tell us a little bit about what, what Christmas looked like in 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 reality for your family i know you've touched on some of this earlier on uh, well with our family obviously we sort of moved into this area um shortly after i got married so we've been up here sort of a good 30 years now but prior to that obviously we would live down um we were down in south london area but all our family was around us and christmas was always we'd always go to somebody's house somebody would always come to us Mum would always put on this massive spread of food. You know, there'd be food to feed the 5,000. You know, she loved her catering and that. Um, to the point, obviously, when she was younger, a teenager, she turned down an apprenticeship at the Savoy. So food was in abundance for that. Um, 
one of her brothers was a, a steward at a golf club. So we then reverted. We were, he would open that up for all of us on Christmas Day. Um, we'd go down there. Mum would help all the catering and that she would sort of orchestrate all of that. And literally all the families would be together. It was wonderful. And then when, obviously, we moved, everybody have sort of got older. It just came down to Christmas was my mum and dad, my husband's family. Um, quite often they weren't with us. Um, and just the children. But we did it for the kids at that point. But she still catered as if there was the 5,000 to feed. And, that. and she loved doing it. That was her thing. She loved cooking. She loved being in that environment. You know, she, um, that was her forte, food. That is the easiest way to, you know, put it. We we had fun family times, parlor games, you know, when we were down south, we'd always play then. Um, you know, all those sort of things that we just kept going with. Um, it was, uh, they were lovely times. They were magical times, as all Christmases were, you know, and you always remember those as a child, you know, how things used to be. And over the years, it all changes. And hopefully I've made some of those memories for my kids oh, in the long run. I'm sure I'm sure you have, because the Christmas that you just described it, it you know, it, it, they sound so wonderful. And I think that just captures the magic of it, actually. And I think mm. and you're, you're right. Christmas it, it is for the children. And, and, and I'm not going to say I'm some kind of bar humbug, but, you know, it gets harder to find that Christmas spirit, doesn't it? Because it's you know, yeah. it's, it's 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 very much for, for young children and, you know, or, or teenage children seem to. And I know some adults, but for many people, it gets a little bit harder. Um, so in terms yeah. of once mum had because obviously once mum had her diagnosis, was she still able to participate in, in helping? I think you said she dressed the turkey early. Yeah, or... no, unfortunately, once she she got a diagnosis and she was put on um, medication and she didn't tolerate it, it seemed to accelerate the disease process as opposed to slow things down. So um, within about f within five months or thereabouts of diagnosis and being put on medication, she had deteriorated quite considerably unfortunately so that was the only Christmas we had before she went into care and she obviously came to me we had to look about how to get her into the house because um, at the front of our house we've got a step but with no grab rails so I had to sort of take around the back so to speak to the tradesman's entrance where she just had one door where she could get in but she could hold either side of the door and the door frame to be able to step up um so that was it. It was just the planning of how to get her in and make sure, obviously, we got all her equipment that she needed and things like that um, to facilitate the smooth running of the day. Those that, sort of things. That is so important. Like you said about making sure you've got the equipment and it's that mm -hmm. that's that preparation again, isn't it? And can I ask you at that point? And I know you've mentioned your son already, but but how old was was he when at the, when? and what what support did he have um well at that diagnosis as soon as we got that we were referred to another charity for their help and support um i don't want to say too much but i wasn't very impressed but he got one-to-one -one counseling with somebody from there but the information they came out with it was a lot for him to sort of sit and read and he couldn't cope with it he struggled to deal with it so i just obviously had to let him come to terms with it all in his own time, give him information as he wanted. You know, there was no point me forcing him to accept this situation. He had to deal with it in his own way. And I was just there to support him at that point in time. It was within um, the January after that Christmas of her diagnosis that we actually met our Admiral Nurse. And I felt that the literature that we were given at that point was more user friendly. The previous charity, we got A4 sheets and that, and it was a lot to wade through. Whereas, obviously, Dementia UK, their leaflets are, as I say, they're user friendly as far as I'm concerned. Oh, the information so is concise. Yeah. You know. 
that honestly that's great to hear and because we we work really hard on on trying to make sure that the the literature that we we provide is user friendly so so I'm really pleased to hear that and I guess what how old was he at that point Denise um he would have been 20 where are we 24 at right. diagnosis yeah, and it is it is difficult, um, you know, it's at twenty four because you are you uh, whilst you're a, a grown up child, you're still you're still very much um, a child, aren't you as well? And 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 that relationship that he had was one of a child with his grandma. So it's you know, it's yeah. She yeah. was actually very instrumental in their upbringing. Uh-huh. You know, she helped yeah. care for them quite a bit, and then. Um, at one point, my husband went to work in the middle of the east. So while I carried on working shift work. Um, she would have them, bear in mind she was in her mid to late 80s, mm-hmm. she would have them, they're coming from school on that college, go there, have a meal, sleep overnight, get up, she'd send them out to school. Mm-hmm. But she was still caring for them. She was still there in their lives. So a very, a very instrumental role that she had in, in Oh, that. God, yes. Doesn't I've got a lot to live up to, put it that way. <laughs> I'm sure you. I'm sure you're living up to it. I, I really am. And and so I guess in terms of, um, you, I know you you not particularly spoke about dad much today, but I, I know dad had dementia as well. So do you think that because in, in my family, I, I I I'm losing track actually of how many people in my family have had or have or or are living with dementia because it seems to be that there's quite a few actually in my family. But do you think that having had that that past experience with dads, do you think that made it any easier or or harder or, or did the um, two not compare? To be honest, I don't know. When my dad was diagnosed with dementia, mum obviously was caring for him. She didn't care for the children at that point. She certainly didn't care for my son because he was that much younger. Um, and that although she was still carrying on caring for my daughter, um, at his diagnosis and when he died, they were sort of six and ten so they were that much younger at that point. But obviously, mum cared for dad. And in that, at that point, I was then caring for mum and helping her deal with it and supporting her. You know, so when he went to sort of a day centre, I'd go around, mum and I would go out for the day. We'd go and do things. So I helped look after her in that respect. We took them away. We went away for a sort of caravan holiday and that. So mum had a break. And that, and obviously, Dad got away. He had a change of environment, um, so it was a very different sort of situation. And I mean, that was well before De- Dementia UK was even in existence. Mm. You know, so we we basically had nothing, no support other than ourselves at that point. I know, I can, I can, I know. and that's that was the same. in my family. My my granddad had to mention that was the same. We we muddled through and mm. and and had very little support actually as as a family with with granddad and, and his dementia. So I, I it, it it does change all the time, doesn't it? And we we get you know hopefully services improve and and things get better over time. And and you know it, it can be really hard though that that sense. And I, and I and I don't know if it's easier if you've done it before because every single person you meet with dementia is different and the the needs that they have and the situation and and even where you're at is is different with each person isn't it and you know what, yeah. what, what you're dealing with so as always I'm a, Vic, can i just say i i always say sorry i'm overriding no, go, no, 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 i on. always say that you know when i started nursing it must be the same for obviously some of you and your colleagues um you know 40 odd years ago you'd walk onto a ward of 30 patients what was dementia? You were lucky, perhaps you had some people on there, one or two people with memory issues. Very lucky if you actually had somebody diagnosed with dementia. Yeah. Whereas nowadays, you walk onto a 30 bedded ward and you've got 95% of people with dementia. Yeah, it's true, and I think there's there's all sorts of you know people are living longer. There's the, the diagnostic processes have got better and sharper, and you know people are getting the the diagnosis um, 
earlier but yeah you're, you're absolutely right and i think in acute hospitals now we, we talk about around about 25 percent of people in an acute hospital at any one time it been actually living with dementia so you know we we know these numbers are, are absolutely going up um all the time and it, it certainly didn't used to be like that and, and again we we know that we're, we're going to approach the sort of two two um, million mark by you know in in our lifetime so it's just going to keep going up um, I wanted to use the last 15 minutes and it always I say it always goes so fast I bet you can't believe when I've just said the last 15 minutes to to think a little bit about um, some some Christmas gifts that to, to to you to share because this is one of the things that I, I I'm a bit interested if you're going to give somebody a gift make it a meaningful gift make it a gift that's going to potentially help them so in my family I've, I've received gifts for people that I'm hoping are going to really help and and, and I thought it'd be just useful to perhaps share some of those um, for, for people listening to, to us tonight talking and so the ones that I like that I'm, I'm just going to share quickly is I, I've I'm a really big fan of the clocks with um, name, with dates and, you know, with the, the day of the week and the time there and whether it's a.m. or p.m. And, you know, I think these there's some people, they, they get called dementia clocks. Other times they get called orientation clocks and and you can get them online. You can get them in Lidl. There's all sorts of different brands available. But but I think those clocks make a really good gift because they really help with orientation and somebody being able to look quickly and, and get a good sense of what what sort of time of day it is and, and where they're where they're at and I guess the other thing that I think and I'm going to ask you all to, about all of you to tell me any tips that you might think of but another one that I really like is um is phones which have got pictures so that you can look or put the space to put names so that if somebody living with dementia wants to phone somebody they can just pick up the phone and press their loved one's picture or their name and it will automatically put the phone through to that person and and again I think that can be really helpful just in terms of keeping somebody safe and giving them that you know that ability to easily connect now both of those things cost money and I guess the other thing to say that I uh, another idea that I absolutely love is just you know sort of rummage boxes stuff that you can put together that doesn't have to cost a fortune that somebody with dementia can just have a have a look through and play with and find different things to interact and and pick up and you know and 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 let's say play with because though the the rummage boxes can be really good to keep somebody busy to keep them entertained to keep them distracted and and to help reduce any anxiety that they might be feeling because they're not maybe not sure what they're supposed to be doing or you know just just what to do in general so so there's some that I would give as have been really good gifts but i know we've all got different ideas about what good gifts are so what would you go with um if, if you've got gifts that you might want to suggest yeah I like... uh, oh sorry denise. oh you both went then <laughs> go on <laughs> sorry denise do you oh denise go on you go first I, I was just gonna say about um i like the idea of uh, a photo book uh, so I can remember one time that I did a bit of a photo book um, for my grandmother and sort of wrote in there about um, different things that had happened way, way back. So when we, when when my nan was regressing, we'd sort of say, oh, yeah, this is the picture for that. And, you know, put some little sort of comments on there and how you were feeling at that time and how much you've, you know, how much love you've got for your loved one and, you know, just something to really make them feel comfortable. Um, so I like the idea of a, a photo book. Um, the other thing that I like is, um, like, sometimes we get uh, people, obviously everyone's had different jobs and things like that, over over the years so maybe something like old work memorabilia uh so if if you know if, if we've got somebody that might like uh tampering with um engines or fixing things you know just something small to sort of take them back to that time because that's a time that they might vividly remember um 
just a couple of ideas there. I like the remote as well. I don't know if anybody know knows about the remote that you can get for the television where it's literally just channel one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then volume up, volume down, channel up, channel down. It's very, very simple and it makes it so much easier um, for people to continue to be independent for much longer because we've simplified what we have to do there. Yeah. I, I love that idea and I, 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 and I remember I forgot about the remotes but you've just reminded me there how, how good they are um, I'm, I'm going to ask you to pop one in in a minute Denise but we've, we've had another suggestion from somebody who, who I'm, I'm always pleased to see in our spaces because they, they do I know join us on a, on a regular basis who's, who's, who's mentioned about um, picture calendars and, and I, I completely agree with you I think they're a fantastic um, gift for somebody because it can help to just orient Orientate someone to that the, their loved ones to see those pictures to see you can even put birthdays and all sorts of dates on there to, to help um, somebody to, to see um, you know, their, their loved ones as they go through the month so thank you very much for Noir Spaces for for that recommendation Denise what would what would you put on the table as a good gift um, the things that I was sort of getting my mum, obviously, it was things like clothes. And certainly when she went into care, it was clothes that were easy for them to use, like cardigans rather than jumpers. You know, thinking of making things easy for them to get dressed and bits and pieces like that. Perhaps depending on what they're like, do they like to, like a few smellies, something like that, hand cream. Little special bits like that. As you say, photos are always a good idea. Um, a perpetual calendar was something that I got my mum at one point to try and keep her orientated with everything. I sort of got a calendar as well that I could write on to say what was happening on a day-to-day -day basis and who was going in. You know, was she going out? Where was she getting her meals from? To try and keep her orientated a little bit. I don't think that worked as well, but everybody's different. But Vic, one thing I would say, obviously you talk about the dementia clocks, if they're speaking clocks, I I would have concerns if somebody hallucinates and they felt that felt there was somebody else in that house. It may cause distress. Yeah, you're you're right. And and in any gifts, you've got to you've got to it's got to be personal. It's got to work for that person. And you know and and the, the, and I, I've not actually used the speaking ones. I've just used the ones with the the images on them. But mm -hmm. but in a, in any gift, it has to be something that that is going to be meaningful and helpful to that person, um, isn't it? And and I guess you know for some people, even pictures could could do that. They could you know, could confuse yeah. you about who's been in the house and and what's going on when you were talking about um calendars and and notices so one of the things that i i use as well quite a bit is whiteboards i'm, I'm a big fan of of a nice whiteboard with you know and, and i guess that's something you could quite easily and cheaply make it look more attractive if you wanted to and you know and, and have that there so that you can write messages or you know call jane or vote you know whatever you want to write on that whiteboard take your tablets um so and so's coming to pick you up at one o'clock whatever it is um, and then rub them out every day can't you to, to help as well or you know these these kind of memory boards or whiteboards with tasks on or you know just just or just nice memories that you want them to to see you know you could write everybody loves you on it it doesn't have to be a task um you know that that could be something that that that's helpful um and anything else that anybody's thinking about that might make a good gift i think perhaps a big thing is as key is it's if you start changing, bringing too many things in, it's that change aspect which they perhaps can't deal with. Mm. Being yeah. aware of that, how they're going to react to the change situation. Yeah, you're you're right. And I, I mentioned earlier when I was talking about rummage boxes and one of the things that I often say with those is you just or or you know, I know people use dolls and teddies and twiddle mitts and all of these sorts of things that are of course out there that that might be helpful. But you you don't you don't have to necessarily I know it's different at Christmas, but just sometimes introduce something to someone's environment and see if it makes a difference. See if it it changes any anything. You know, it's it's nice to give somebody a gift, but sometimes you might think, actually, I'm just going to introduce this into their space now, and I'm going to do it now because it's Christmas. But I'm just going to introduce it and see if it if it helps and if it makes a difference. Um, 
So and I guess any other gifts that people can think of. I know that we've had a comment from Helen who said, um, oh, it's a recommendation um, for Christmas. And that's around recommending shortening the festivities if a person gets confused easily. And um, and actually, you're, you're absolutely right, because if somebody is getting confused and if they're getting if you can see that they've been over stimulated it's too much just reduce the amount of time that that you spend and with somebody because people we can all get tired at christmas it, it can be a really tiring time so so you, you don't necessarily need to see the person for hours and hours or for a whole weekend sometimes actually 10 minutes is enough or half an hour you know just just do what what feels right so that you can have that period of joy that period of happiness um and and not necessarily think that it has to be all day and and for hours because i know you'd asked about recommendations to help it less tiring or confusing with somebody with dementia so that's that's some of the things that that i i would think about um in terms of helping that liz is there anything that to helen's point that you you question that you'd like to add to in terms of how to make it less make it less tiring for somebody yeah just just small amounts of stimulation you know perhaps dipping in and out again like we touched upon earlier about making sure that um uh, whoever you're with you know the, they've all got a little bit of a role because sometimes it can be um you know tiring for for us too uh so making sure that everyone's got their own role within this um yeah cutting if if it needs to be that that times are cut a little bit short that's absolutely fine um but we need you know sometimes it's nice to just uh be with somebody maybe on a one-to-one -one, so the quiet space you know keeping um keeping stimulation to a minimum and yeah keep, if it needs to be cut down the time that's that's absolutely fine that's no problem whatever works I think I think that's the key whatever works you'll find what works for your loved one you know them the best Thanks. And I'm just going to read out another couple of messages because they might be useful for people if you've not seen them. So um, British Sikh nurses, as, as suggested, video messages are a good idea too. And, and I completely agree with that. You know, if, if somebody's able to to interact and, and to do that, then, you know, a, a video message is really useful if you're not near your loved one as well. Um, that, that might really be, be something that's that's nice for them. And they can potentially watch that again and again. Um, Aranda has said that she's got one from mum i'm not sure which which what where we were talking about then and what you've got but i'm, I'm really pleased that it, it's been helpful for you oh i think actually sorry i've, I've read the, the comment below so i now know what it is it, i think it was a wooden sign that you were talking about that um that says home sweet home with the first line of the address underneath it oh i love that idea that's that's a fantastic idea because it just gives somebody that that orientation to where they are and and where, where you know that they're, they're where they they should be and home sweet homes are a really lovely message too so fantastic thank you everybody for for sharing those liz did you want to yeah music's a really good um way of, of providing a calmness for people and reminiscing making memories that in fact triggering memories from the past with music that people love i know that i mean for all of us um you know songs different songs have different meanings and trigger different memories and if we can trigger a nice memory for somebody you know that's always gonna maybe make them feel uh less anxious and yeah. sort of more loved um so yeah music's a really good way to mm -hmm. to try and distract and and keep things nice uh, i can't i can't believe we, we nearly didn't mention that thanks Liz, <laughs> because you're absolutely right music it just connects to a part of our brains that is, is so important so and i can hear some music playing now so, <laughs> so i guess we're coming up towards the end of our space um this evening it always goes so incredibly fast um i guess the things to say is if christmas doesn't go the way you want it to if you do end up at the end in january feeling it was all a bit of an anticlimax as things didn't go to plan you know just 
it's that that can be normal it can feel like that because we build it up so much in in the run up to christmas and i guess just you know it's time where we often reflect and we think about what do we want the next year to bring and and to be like so if you do start to feel any of those thoughts or feelings into the new year speak to somebody if you need to give yourself some you know some some time to just don't make any sudden changes just you know sort of see see how things pan out and like denise you were saying earlier just just give yourself a breather be kind to yourself if you do start to think actually these january blues are not just normal this is something else they you know, do obviously get some professional help and and i'm, I'm going to obviously say our, our helpline is there as well to provide support to people if if they do think actually i i'm i'm not managing to to kind of get get you know get myself back up, up and running again so just just you know to, to be kind to yourself all that's really left is for me to wish you a very Merry Christmas, everybody who's who's listening um, this evening. I hope that you found some of our conversation helpful. Um, it's been delightful to, to have my, my, my speakers up with me this evening, and we've had lots of questions from people. I hope that I've managed to answer the questions that have come in and, and not missed anybody. But if, if I have, I'll, I'll look at them afterwards and, and ping you a response over. Denise and Liz, thank you so much. Do you want to unmute and say goodbye quickly? Anything? Goodbye. Thank, thank you. you for listening. Oh, thank you, Denise. Merry, Merry Christmas to everybody. Us. Yeah, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Um, thank you. Be thank kind. You. Be kind. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And, and thank you because I do spot some regular listeners who join our spaces on a regular basis. So thank you to you two. You know who you are and have a wonderful Christmas to, to all of you. Thank you. Bye bye.